please welcome Dean Bradshaw. Thank you, sir. How you doing? Welcome to the Democracy Forum. Um, yeah, thank you for coming. I really uh, admire what the guys at Creative Mornings do, and when John invited me, I felt very flattered to talk to my peers, which is really nice. Now, do I need a clicker, John, or can I just yeah, kind of go through? Okay. So, when John said, you're going to talk about sound, I immediately cringed into a corner. Um, he helped me interpret that into this whole listening idea, um, which is something I'm really kind of passionate about, I think especially now, in this kind of climate we're in at the end of 2016. Um, it's just kind of, maybe you kind of reevaluate what it is to be a creative. Um, I think it's so easy to keep our head down, um, making the work, and then kind of forget that there is a world around us. And I think we all got kind of woken up to that recently. Let me use a clicker. So, so yeah, the idea is listen. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I started making pictures of lizards uh, and snakes. Comes with the Australian thing, I guess. Um, so the reason I kind of mentioned this is that I started as a zoologist. Uh, I was really, really into animals, had a very strange upbringing, um, catching animals, and you know, really thought that this is what I was going to do for the rest of my life. So I spent five or six years as a field biologist in Australia. My job was to catch these guys and eventually kind of got really interested in photographing them. Um, and from there, got really into lighting and suddenly, oh, I want to be a photographer, not a zoologist, so it kind of made this jump. And the reason I mention it is, I think, you know, they talk about this idea that you change your career multiple times through, the, through your lifetime. I never kind of gave that any credit. I was like, no, nope, going to do this, going to be the, uh, you know, catcher of animals for the rest of my life, and then made this transition moved to America, um, and just wanted to kind of put that out there, because I think sometimes it can be hard to make that jump, and it really was for me, um, but, uh, you know, eventually you kind of get there. So, um, you know, riffing on the idea that the guys do with their magazine, um, I love what they do, and I think the title speaks to me in particular, and I think all creatives. For the longest time, I was making these pictures, and I really wasn't satisfied. I, I, you know, that there's that Ira Glass video that went viral about taste and how for the longest time in the beginning you're making things and they're just not satisfying to you. So that was really me. I was taking all these pictures. I actually went through them for this talk. I didn't, I didn't post any here, but I was like, oh my God, I was terrible. Um, I really was, you know, like um, I was just taking these pictures of all different things, people, animals, landscapes. Um, and if I was to look at that stuff now, it is so different from where I am today. Um, and so just pushing through that, just pushing through that inability to pull things off that you want to, I think it's really important because it's very easy to kind of give up in the early stages. I mean, now, you know, I'm not, I don't draw, I'm not a creative, yada, yada, yada. So for me, pushing through that and just kind of almost like giving myself a mantra or like a hoodwinking myself into the fact that you can be a photographer, you know, the whole millennial idea, you can be whatever you want to be. Um, and so drinking that whole Kool-Aid really helped me early on. So then from there, I kind of started doing this very kind of um, over-processed, hyper-realistic advertising photography. That's kind of the, was the big thing in the mid-2000s. Um, and I really looked at all this work out there online and I, I want to make something like that. So I started doing this kind of out of this world of trend and what I really was into when I kind of started and then kind of got dissatisfied with this kind of vibe after a while. I was like, hang on a second, am I just going to leave a bunch of billboards behind? Um, to me, it wasn't very, didn't have as much depth as I wanted it to, but it was a good start. It let me kind of springboard my career because I was making something that was in demand. So it helped me kind of my trajectory kind of take off from there. Um, so now I do a lot of, you know, work with brands. I'm a commercial photographer. I do a little bit of directing, but don't we all in LA? Um, and so I work with brands like these. And the reason I bring this up is not to be impressive at all, because you know, there are many photographers and directors with much more interesting Rolodexes, but for the fact that getting sucked into this kind of work, which is easy to in this town, um, kind of leads you into this trap. And I didn't speak about this at the last talk, because it's something I've just been thinking about recently, but I think it's very easy to be obsessed with being commercially successful, having a career, and being like a legitimate commercial creative, and then getting sucked into project after project, and I find myself in that right now, where you don't actually spend time to listen to yourself and look inward. Got to throw the kind of theme out there. Um, <laughs> and, and really decide what it is that drives you. I think I find myself, okay, I'm doing treatments and treatments and conference calls and, and shoots, and all this is great, 
But I, I can see how that can just kind of consume you for many years, and then I will just not be creating anything that really satisfies me. So the theme of this is, is really a conversation with myself about how do you kind of broach that? How am I able to make work that has some sort of, makes or some sort of difference, um, makes an impact, and just really keeps me creatively satisfied? Because if you want to do this for 20, 30, 40 years, I feel like it's very easy to get burnt out making billboards for people. Um, and that's kind of what I do a lot of, you know? Is, is commercial campaigns based on work that I've done, and I think it can be very easy to kind of one after the other after the other. Um, now, this is something I'll talk about a little later on, but this whole idea of this is incredible power. You know, creative people in this room, probably working at big agencies, you're probably great designers, freelancers. We have a lot of power, um, and that's something I wanted to talk about as well, especially photographers. If you're a big social media photographer, which I'm not really, but if you're a big Instagrammer, you have a big network, or you're just making projects for some of the biggest brands in the world, which I'm sure many of you are, you have incredible power. I mean, to be able to make stuff like this that millions of people see, I really think is something that I'm really finding myself engaged with a bit more. It's, it's an incredible opportunity to be able to communicate with a lot of people, and it's never been easier to do so. So now I kind of make all sorts of um, work that runs a big gamut in terms of style and look and feel. I tend to make a lot of dark, weird stuff. Um, which is a little bit of this, different character um, analysis. And I bounce around between these dark, moody um, pieces and then, you know, fun little pieces like this that kind of engage with the whole different side of myself. Um, and a lot of this talk is not really going to be about illustrating my career and showing you how I've done what I'm talking about. It's very much themes that I'm thinking about right now because I want to move from bouncing around, doing lots of different projects, into a more tip of the spear kind of approach where I'm really trying to say something about deeper, you know, ideas. So the reason this is all important, because I think this talk can get conceptual sometimes, is this idea of style. And I think no matter what sort of creative you are, it's particularly pertinent for photographers, because we're all told we have to have a style, especially um, commercially. But I think it's a very interesting thing to consider, because I think when you have a style or a certain work that stands out there and you see it and you know that that's that person's work, I think it gives you a lot of power, gives you commercial success, um, and it just gives you something that's recognizable and kind of your fingerprint. So it's something I think about a lot, um, particularly as a photographer. So as a photographer, you're using a machine to make pictures. Um, I think painters and designers and typographers have a much more organic, kind of um, intuitive way of engaging with their art. They're sketching, they're drawing, they're they're directly going from their body to the, the page. Whereas as photographers, we're using a, you know, a little machine um, and they're coming out every three months or so that makes the picture. So in theory, we're just finding scenes and we're putting our machine in front of it. So really what's in front of the camera is kind of how we develop our style and then also how we interpret the image. So Tuck Close has a really interesting take on this about how it is really a difficult medium to kind of make your own style because and anyone can do it more than ever right now. Um, so taste is another theme that I wanted to talk about. It comes back to that, that Ira Glass talk. Um, I think our taste is always kind of being pushed along, and I find myself enjoying things now that I just didn't in the past. And I think really being aware of your own taste is something I'm trying to think more about, because it's always changing, but if you can kind of dial into what your taste is and create work that's in that world, I think you'll be the most creatively satisfied. So I find myself... It's constantly changing, and I'm going to give you guys an exercise that you can do to kind of really examine this. Um, but it's just something I wanted to kind of bring up. So the biggest theme, you know, now that I've mentioned a little bit about myself, was this concept of why, which is kind of started by Simon Sinek, who's spoken at these kind of events that I'm a big fan of. And I started to, after I was creating all these campaigns and got really commercially successful quite young, I started to think, why am I doing what I'm doing, you know? It's one thing to kind of get to the point of creating work and, you know, getting clients and making money and paying your expensive gentrified rent and things like that. Um, but uh, after that, it's like, what am I going to leave behind? Um, and I saw this because I, was, I had worked with a couple of commercial photographers, very successful in the advertising space. But I wondered, if you were gone tomorrow, what would you leave behind? Um, what kind of legacy? And I didn't want to leave a bunch of billboards or ads that spoke to products. I wanted to think, what could I leave um, that would actually maybe, you know, resonate with someone? So Simon Sinek, you're probably all familiar with. 
has this concept of the golden circle, which I think really helps when applied to creative. Because I think so often I was spending my time determining what I would photograph or how I would photograph it, and I would, we get obsessed with technique. I think in all industries, whether it's design, you know, flat design and, and this, that, and the other, and then photography, all the different styles that are around. And so often we would start with the what. What camera are we using? What are we photographing? I need, you know, the logo bigger. I need to make the butt look better. Like all these kinds of things that we, we would use different lighting and, and we can get obsessed. There's a whole industry built around this what and this how. But I kind of wanted to dig a little bit deeper and try to get to the why of what we're doing. And I really find this is a useful concept because, especially directing more and more, the why, the kernel of the idea, should really motivate everything else. And directors do that really well, where the story is the why, and the cinematography, the styling, the actors, everything is to support that kernel in the center. So it's a really good book. I really recommend it. So I started to ask myself, what do you believe in? And I, I think I've been doing this more and more in the last few months in this current climate, because I've realized if I want to say something, it needs to be based on what I believe. And I think this idea, it doesn't need to be that I want to save the whales or you know, cure AIDS in Africa. It can also be, what do you believe is important? Are you interested in some weird, obscure thing that other people aren't? Do you really love food? Do you really love cakes? Whatever it might be. Um, so what is it that you really feel is important? So I do this exercise. I just did it before uh, I came here. These are very amorphous ideas that are quite large in many of these many cases. And I would actually imagine that a lot of guys my age would probably have a lot of similar interests. So they're not super unique, but a few of these um, I you know I dig into. And this is a really useful exercise to do to really identify what you believe in and how that can inform the work. So with photography, it's very straightforward. You're interested in a subject matter you go and photograph that, right? How this might apply to design might be a little bit amorphous, but um, so this is a really interesting exercise because I suddenly put on paper what interests me. And then from there, I have a really good base of perhaps where I might want to go with a personal project, what I might like to photograph. And it also helps me clarify what I want to avoid. If suddenly I'm thinking, oh, okay, everyone's shooting dancers. I mean, I saw this project of dancers Maybe I should go to go do that. It's very easy to get into that vibe as a photographer. You kind of find yourself seeing cool things and then riffing on that. Or, oh, I have a friend who's a, I don't know, a DJ. I'm going to go do DJ photography. It's very easy to follow those little rabbit holes. But with this, I found it's nice because I can go, okay, is it within the realm of what I really think is important? And if it's not, perhaps I don't pursue that. So right now, I've got a project I'm doing Mongolia. Um, gun culture I'm doing a little project on. And these are kind of all in development. Um, Craftman was a theme I've kind of developed a little bit. So this is great because it gives me a base to come back to, uh, which I think is just really helpful. So it's a, an exercise I definitely recommend. So Simon, coming back to Simon Sinek, the reason this is important commercially as well, I think, is when I can talk to clients, like so I shoot Indian Motorcycles Campaign, which is something I really, really enjoy. I love motorcycle culture. I love riding. I love what it represents. And... Coming from that place when I shoot is really useful, not only in shooting, but also in communicating to clients, communicating to all the guys in the scene. It's a very kind of, you know, it's not closeted, but it's a kind of small subculture, very, very active with people who love this shit. So it's really nice to be able to communicate to them from a place of really loving, you know, what that represents. So I think people don't, you know, buy what you do. So you could take great pictures of things and they might look nice, but if you don't really love that subject, I think at some point it will come out, or at some point it will kind of hurt you in, in terms of is it really something you're interested in? You know, because I think so many of us, especially in the beginning as photographers, we just photograph stuff that we see that people photograph, right? Whether it's portraits of artists, okay? It's, you know, chicks with a few clothes on. Um, it's motorcycles riding around and jumping off ramps. It's skateboarding. There are lots of things that we tend to kind of gravitate towards, and I just, it's not that those things and not worth pursuing, it's just I like to try and remind myself, do I really love this thing? If I was a writer, would I write a book about it? If I was on a desert island, would I still be interested in this thing? You know, is it something I really, really engage with? So I like to remind myself of that idea. So examine your taste always. So this kind of takes me to a little exercise that I really enjoy that I'm going to kind of show you. Um, I think a lot of photographers know about this, but you know, it might be useful if you're in a different sphere. So just kind of being in touch with the visual side is the other part of the coin. 
I think it's very easy for me to sit here and say, you know, I'm interested in this, that, and the other, and you go out and photograph that, but maybe you're not, you know, you're not doing it in a way that's unique to you, or you're, the visual side of that subject exploration just isn't as interesting as it could be. So it's one, on the one hand, knowing your subject is really, really important, but on the other hand is how you address it visually and what you're drawn to visually. So this is a little exercise that I really like to do. I just did it before the talk, and it was quite interesting because it had shifted from where it was before. Um, so really gathering all the things that motivate and inspire you visually and putting them in one place. And we all kind of do it in our mind, I think. We kind of know what we're drawn to. We like certain artists. We like certain designers. But when you actually grab pieces of the work and put it, I have like a big um, Dropbox folder. I think I have about eight or 9,000 pictures in there that I've just grabbed from everywhere, like swipe folders many art directors have. And then I just did this before, but I have a Lightroom catalog that kind of documents it all. And then I just create a collection within that. And then I dump you know, this was about, I think it was about 50 or 70 images in this case, of the things I'm really vibing with right now. And that's constantly going to change. It's actually really interesting to see how it changes um, through your career. So this is something I really, really recommend you do. Um, and then once you have this, this is especially useful in the beginning. Now this is, if you're, if you're really established and you have your look and feel and have your, your career underway and are known for a certain thing, maybe it's not as important. But I remember in the beginning, this was really important to me because I could see what are the common threads, um, what are the things that are in common between these images, and from there I think I can help you know, develop what I'm drawn to. And then once you have that, you can put those ingredients into the work. So let's say you're a designer, you identify that you know, really interesting use of type is important, perhaps high key is important, perhaps the color red becomes important. You can kind of start to see patterns. We're pattern-seeking animals. So if we can kind of look through and see what patterns are formed here, I really think that's something, it's just a really great base that I found that I can put into the work. So I'm constantly playing catch up. My work never really gets to where I want it to be with this stuff, but it gives me a really good you know, point to, to direct myself to. And yeah, so with great power comes great responsibility. That's something that just I added to this. It's something I've been thinking about a lot in this climate recently, no matter what side of the tracks you're on. I think a lot of creative people have a lot of power. And I think for so long, myself included, we've been very complacent in terms of just creating work that looks pretty or maybe engages with something that's maybe not as important as it could be. So something I'm really focusing on maybe for the new year is what in, in this conversation that's happening right now, whether it's the politics, the environment, social justice, whatever you're into, perhaps you can contribute something. You guys have amazing power, you're working on really big brands, Imagine if you could take that brand strategy or that design you do and apply it to something that really matters to you. You really could make a difference, I think. And if you look at like punk rock in the 70s, look at a guy like Banksy, there are guys out there doing this and perhaps there might be a renaissance in this kind of direction uh, amongst creatives. So this is something I'm really excited about. I haven't done it yet, so I'm definitely not a good example of this. That's kind of, this is the conversation to myself. Dean, you've been doing all this commercial work. You've been taking your pictures of guys on motorcycles with beards. Who gives a fuck? Um, why don't you do something that matters? So that's kind of something I wanted to leave you guys with. Um, and hopefully it might spring, you know, an idea from there. And then beyond all this, um, I really like this quote because it helps me with my procrastination. Um, I tend to get very conceptual, as you even saw in this, this talk. And I think it's just always helpful to remind ourselves that we can talk all we want, but it's, you know, until we put pen to paper, it doesn't really matter. So thank you. Yeah.